Yeah, so this should be like the speakerphone execution. So it's like somebody who gets their head chopped off with a guillotine while their phone's playing something on speakerphone. And they're like, you're welcome, society. Yeah. Hello, everybody, and welcome to 500 Open Tabs. I'm Kava Taharian, and normally this is where Hannah Hillam would fill in and explain that she is also part of this podcast but sadly she is too cool for us and has gone off on a fun book tour because she's fancy however we are still cool without her and in fact some would argue that we're going to be even cooler today because filling in for hannah is our very own she listen first of all list of credentials she's a podcast editor for a very mid podcast (laughs) you might have heard of (laughs) 500 open tabs (laughs) Top of the resume. <laughs> Top of the resume, mid-podcast editor. <laughs> She's also an extremely talented illustrator and artist. But most importantly, as we always like to say, the third and most important fact about her is that she's our friend. Please welcome back to the podcast, Miss Alyssa Cooper. Woo! Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here for the second time. Thrilled to have you. 26 episodes later. Oh my God, I did not, Hannah and I were talking about like who was going to fill in for you or who was going to fill in for her. And of course the first thought was Alyssa. And then I was like, oh, didn't she, wasn't she just on, I didn't realize it was 25 episodes ago. It's insane. Yeah. yeah. It's time has flown. We. Dude. <laughs> it's wild. I'm. <laughs> Unreal. I kind of don't realize, you know, cause we, we've got a good output right now until someone will like reference an episode way back and then I just have to scroll and scroll and scroll mm-hmm. and I'm like oh that was that was in our early days so yeah it's it's been really fun to be on this journey with you guys and like happy to be here <laughs> yeah you were it was episode 10 I think right it was just yeah crazy I honestly thought that that was like a month ago and it turns out it's months and months ago well time isn't real and yeah so... that's true <laughs> <laughs> and we both kind of lost our minds this summer with like San Diego Comic-Con. and It was a lot. It was a lot. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking the time to fill in um, for Hannah. I know you're going to have to unfortunately be doing double duties on this one. Uh, (laughs) And of course, we're we're recording this one a little bit earlier than we were going to in the schedule because we wanted to make sure that we got a chance to talk about uh, you being at LA Comic-Con. So for those of you who are in Los Angeles this weekend, please go and see Alyssa. She's going to be at uh, In Artist Alley in the big room at table what? A49. A49. Tell them about what you're going to have. Um, So I'm going to be selling some art prints and some stickers, kind of have a good blend of like some charcoal pieces and some digital pieces. So yeah, I don't really know how to describe my style. It's it's like illustrative, but not, I don't know. It's one of those things I'm like, I just, I just draw stuff. I don't know. (laughs) That's all you can do. That's all we ever do. Our style is not for us to describe. It's for others to, you know. Yeah. It's a, it's a hard thing to kind of put into words. But it's good stuff, though. That's all that matters. And thank you. it's Alyssa's stuff. So if you listen to this podcast and you like it, go support her and buy her stuff. Otherwise, I will fight you because I will also be at LA Comic Con on Sunday on yes. a Mina panel. Go in see a room your panel. <laughs> that I don't remember right now because I forgot to include that because I was so concerned with making sure that you got to plug your thing that I forgot that I'm also going to be on a panel and I should advertise that. Hold, you should. please. <laughs> <laughs> I should know that. <laughs> I got it right here. Okay, so on Sunday, which will be October 6th, at uh, in room 407 from 3 to 4, that will be where I'm on my Mina panel at the Los Angeles Convention Center. So please come check it out. Yeah, and it's a great panel. I went at WonderCon. You did? Yeah, WonderCon is when you came. Super interesting. Really great people on the panel. I highly recommend it. And, of course, go sell, go support Kappa. Yes, Come, Please. come to the table, come to the panel. It'll be a great time. Anyway, uh, but enough of that, enough of our self plugs. We can get a little bit more, actually stick around at the end of the episode. We're going to show some of Alyssa's artwork as well. But seeing as how this is your first proper co-hosting duty, not yeah. as a guest host, but as like a guest co-host. The pressure's um, on. Pressure's on. You're going to go first. You get to take Hannah's place. You better bring the Hannah, Hannah sanity. No, well. not at all. <laughs> You got to bring the Alyssanity. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about like all the tabs I went down for this because I, I did kind of channel Hannah at one point. I, I jumped on like Ancestry.com, was trying to find Ooh, people. That's the fun. whole thing. I think she would have done a much more thorough job because she's very good at that research. 
and I was I'm, just like this I'm person. I'm always impressed by it. Yeah, it's hard. It's like she'll she'll go read like records, records, and then like she'll yeah. download stuff. And I'm like, I don't have that kind of ADHD. I can't do that part of it. She's yeah, definitely a talent of hers. But yeah, let's see how I do. Let's see what happens. It's gonna um, be great. All right. So my tab this week is uh-huh. from an article called "How Three Sisters Revolutionized England's Penny Arcades." Oh. And that is by Jenny Elliott from Atlas Obscura. But I came across this and kind of thought it was really, really fascinating. So I'll just jump in. How much do you know about Penny Arcades, first of all? I'm assuming that at this time, what, what, did you say the year yet? Not yet. So okay. we're looking at like 1890 to 1940, kind of that range. Okay. So these arcades are not, are these like video arcades where you're pumping something in and watching something like kind of what we talked about in the... Uh... Thomas Edison episode? Yeah, yeah. So these are like coin-operated machines. And this was mostly before like the kinetoscope and motion pictures in that way. And so a lot of these were started off as like fortune-telling machines. So think of like... Zoltar. Yeah, Zoltar from Big. (laughs) Pretty much. uh, People were really into this. And for a long time, these little like mechanical automatons just like weren't that exciting like by today's standards people loved them and it was all clockwork so uh not no electricity it was all very intricate and um we're gonna talk first of all about these sisters dad because he's kind of where the story starts okay um his name is john dennison john dennison john strong name (laughs) oh johnny den Johnny Den, not Johnny Denver, Johnny Den. <laughs> uh, he, in his 20s, in like the 1870s, uh-huh. started to have a hobby of making these little automatons. He he had an engineering background. He, he okay. worked at an engineering firm. But in his spare time, he would just make these little models that would move. And people loved them. Nice. And so, they, again, they weren't that exciting by today's standards. So, like... He would make agricultural machinery models to show. Like, Honestly, how... that, that's a whole. Th- I'm sure there's going to there's like a Reddit group about or like a Reddit thread about oh this. There's Facebook groups, I'm sure, dedicated. Oh, yeah. So... It's this is a whole world that I didn't yeah. realize existed. Um... <laughs> Had the Internet been around, that man would have been extremely popular in certain it been like, threads. Yes. And honestly, yes. I, w- I would watch it. I mean, yeah, he would have a YouTube channel. People would love he would have been rich. <laughs> I watch like the videos of like on YouTube where it's just someone like cleaning and restoring an old toy or piece oh, yeah. of machinery. And I yeah. think that stuff's fascinating. Yeah. So I probably would have been pretty into this. But so that's where John starts his career. And he, okay. like I said, doesn't do narrative hasn't like come into his machines yet. Okay. He he has made like a few about ships. And like I said, farming equipment. And he starts taking these around England and exhibiting them. And people love them. Like Sweet. Draws crowds. And then something that's really notable about John is that he decided to make his machines coin-operated. Making so like, money. Yeah. So he wasn't the inventor of the coin-operating mm-hmm. system. But he is one of like the first recorded people we have who actually made a living off of these. Sweet. So yeah, he, he was kind of an innovator in that way. Yeah, 130 and years later, I still don't know how to make money off of my hobbies. I try. <laughs> I spend more money than than I make. It's fine. Should we add a coin op to the bottom of this podcast and just yes. be like, got to put in a penny to hear? Subscribe to our Patreon if you haven't done so yet. Yes, we'll put the link up. <laughs> and by we, I mean I will. Alyssa, get on that, please, in the edit. <laughs> so, okay, so John... John has these machines, and he starts to kind of notice that people like things that are morbid. That's true, and it's and it's still true today. So like, yeah. he his models start to turn a little more dark, a little more macabre. Yeah. Um, one of his most famous ones is called the French Execution. Oh, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> a coin-operated guillotine. It's literally a guillotine. It's amazing. Amazing. <laughs> And like, um, I'll send you, I can send you videos. I do have these. Yes. We can put them up on the screen too. Yes. Hopefully. Or they're, Check out they're our quick. YouTube. They're, they're quick, right? All they're of not these like... are 30 seconds or less. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. We'll, we'll include um, some of the clips on here. All right. The coin's going in. It's very elaborate. It's like, a, oh yeah. my God. This is what this guy made or this is like sort of based on it? This is what John made. 
Holy shit. This is it's, really elaborate. This is so not intricate. what I expected. <laughs> right? Oh my god. No, it looks like a straight up painting with like multiple layers on it. Yeah, I thought it kind of looked like someone took oh, a wow. Renaissance painting and like made it into Melissa, paper these dolls. are incredible. Holy shit. Right? Wow. No, so it's yeah, like a what, moving painting. Yeah. What sorry. What sticks, what sticks out to you on on this painting? <laughs> I mean, it's like there's the so it's got two layers or sorry, two levels. So like the upper level is where they're doing the executing and then underground it looks like they're all drinking and getting drunk if i remember my lame is correctly that's where they're all uh they're all plotting what to do to like overthrow everybody in the they're, not the french revolution the next part i forget what it was called where lame yeah. takes place they're um they're singing about being sad down there yeah exactly uh they're <laughs> yeah they're drinking they're banging on the table they're yeah they're just going about their one guy's hitting his own head one person looks like she's crying on the ground it's just like you know, business as usual. And then upstairs, <laughs> there's a dude who's like, looks like he's trying to pet a horse, although that might not be it. He's probably cheering. Oh, my God. And then the head gets chopped off. And then the dude who's like below at the guillotine, like picks up the head. Yeah. And the best part. <laughs> this is so, listen, legitimately, this is incredible. I'm so impressed by this. This guy just did this for fun in the 1870s. This, So we're around the 1890s at this 1890, point. 1890, Okay. Um, he's kind of like honed his craft. But yeah, oh this is so before cool. the 1900s. Yeah, pretty wild. Oh, I love it so much. That one's gorgeous. And I and you'll see that like the models that the sisters do are not this, but it's good to know like where they kind of got their start. This is their stock that they came from. Yeah, so this is their dad. And um, from what I was reading, their dad really valued their contributions. Like once the sisters were old enough to sort of help and pitch mm -hmm. in and really encourage them to like learn about it and take part of the craft um so that kind of comes into play okay soon so cool so <laughs> cool right duper. where where is that one with the video of that they took is it still in um so that i believe it's no in deal. england it's, it's in somewhere england. in england okay i was just saying, so that's is it like available to the public is there like a museum or something yes these so there are a few like penny arcade museums sprinkled around the world and that's so where if any of these survived, we hope that they ended up. But as you can see from just that one, like they're very intricate. They are yeah. one-off machines. So not a lot exists. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a big deal when like when we when people find them. Yeah. You're not calling the tech guy from whatever, you know, Penny Arcade doc, <laughs> no. or Penny Arcade corporate to show up in his truck to just be like, ah, see what you got. You got a busted machine here. You got to swap out the guts. Put Do in a raspberry an pie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gotta call my, customer support. My guillotine's not working well. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be there between 1 and 5 p.m. In the meantime, just cut the head off manually. <laughs> Typical. Yeah. Back to John. He mm -hmm. is in a town called Blackpool, England. Nice. Which is kind of on the northern coast and in the 18, late 1800s was very small, like population of 500 people. Okay. And then Blackpool starts to try to become kind of a seaside resort. And they do this pretty successfully because they start copying innovations from other places. So like mm -hmm. they put in a Ferris wheel after the Ferris wheel debuts. Sure. And they're like their big thing is called the Blackpool Tower. And it's it looks like <laughs> it's still there. It's yeah, really it's... cool. It's like the top third of the Eiffel Tower has just been lopped off, just kind of sitting on the street. Weird. Um, so they, they made this tower, and inside they put an entertainment complex. Okay. Because they were like, this is going to make us money. People yeah. are going to come here. And John is very smart and secures a contract with this tower to be the only provider of their nice. penny arcade machines. <laughs> I mean, if you looked at that one, you'd just be like, hell yeah, bro, I'll give you the contract. Who else? Yeah. I'll give you how many pennies do you want? Yeah, I, I'll give you I support the arts. I'll give you as yeah. much money as you want. So he's very established. He kind of like now has a working company. He doesn't have to worry about any competition. Like mm -hmm. he's pretty solid. So also in the complex, um, they had an aquarium and an aviary and a seal pond. This sounds great. I w I'm like, this sounds Can like we a go? Blast. Let's go right now. <laughs> I will go. Let's stop recording. <laughs> um, and Looking it only cost now. about $2.50 in today's money to go. 
to like enter into the building to be able to access all that stuff. Yeah. Nothing. It's a steal. Such a steal. And so this was very successful. So that's just kind of Blackpool Tower. And that's where most of our story takes place. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned, John has three daughters. Their names are Florence, Alice, and Evelyn. Solid they, 19th century names. So good. And uh, these three daughters, it seems like they had pretty private personal lives. Okay. Um, but like I said, John really encouraged them to like take to participate in the business. Mm-hmm. And there's several accounts that say that he like strongly discouraged them from marrying. He was like, you don't have to marry. You Just can... live with me. <laughs> Just live with me and make my machines. Forever. <laughs> and they're like, okay. <laughs> and they kind of do. Um, <laughs> John cool. dies. Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine at the time it was a thing of like, you guys don't have to marry to like make a living. You can keep doing this business and yeah. you'll be fine. That's not typical at the time necessarily right. either. Yeah, very kind of unheard of at the time. And yeah. so when John finally passes at the age of 77, we're at 1924, rest in peace. Oh, he he dies much later than 1924. Much okay. later. Yeah, okay. so they, they've had this company going for about 30 years at this yeah, point. Yeah, 30 years, yeah. And the sisters are at a crossroads and they're like, well, do we keep the business or do we sell it off? And so as a unit, they decide, no, we're going to, we have some ideas and we're going to keep going with it. Love it. They start kind of small with like sort of upgrading the machines that he's already made. Mm-hmm. And the sisters, again, kind of notice that the themes that people really latch onto are these morbid things. Yes. Like, uh, let me read some of the names of these machines. I'm, I'm so unbummed because we don't have visual records of a lot of them. Oh, okay. We know the names. <laughs> I, listen, um, we're just going to let your imagination run. That's the fun part of it. We've got the dying child. <laughs> <laughs> okay, left field. Woo. Not the fun kind of morbid, but like the morbid kind of but morbid. Like, yeah, there's a... a Not sure another... I want to put in a penny and watch a child die necessarily, but... What a fun day at the aquarium. <laughs> wow, okay. We've got that. We have... Supper with Death. Okay, that's fun. I like that. That one's pretty fun. Uh, Midnight in the Haunted Graveyard. That's nice. And then uh, their first model that they made completely from scratch without any of their dad's stuff was called the Haunted Grange. 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 Okay. This was in 1929, and it's a little mini manor where a supernatural killing occurs. Oh. They also, this was also kind of the period of, it's called like the golden era of crime. And so people, okay. much like now, were really into like <laughs> true crime and crime novels and yeah, yeah. mysteries. And so the sisters really wanted to not just make something that was cool to watch work, but something mm-hmm. that had a reveal and like had some drama. Okay. So yeah. So they're giving it like a proper arc. Yeah. So they're like, how can we make this like a little bit more, it draws you in. Yeah. And so, yeah, so they make Haunted Grange super successful. And then a year later, they make one called Spook House. And this one has a levitating telephone. (gasps) And uh, they decide to switch from clockwork to electricity. Okay. So this was notable because now they didn't have to pay a staff member to stand there and, like, wind the machine. Oh, I was going to say, is it all just cranked is what they were doing? Yeah. Was it cranked each time or was it, like, it was just somebody was just doing it the entire time? I think it was cranked and then, like... It would run out of, I don't know. redo it. Like, kind of like a watch or something? Or yeah, like that's what I'm imagining. For... Yeah. <laughs> uh, but now they didn't have to do that. They had electricity. Question. And so they didn't, yes. Do you, maybe you'll get into this. But, so for example, the last one that you showed us, uh, the uh, the guillotine one. Yeah. Was, was the dad also, he did the painting for all that as well? Or are they commissioning people to do these paintings? So that part's a little unclear. I don't okay. believe that he did the painting. It seems like John sometimes did his own art, but sometimes would take existing automatons, automatons and sort of improve maybe, on yeah. them. I see. And okay. so for the guillotine one, I kind of think that he didn't. It is so intricate. And it's like, a really elaborate painting. Yeah. I was like, that is not something I, I was not at all what I expected it to look like. No, it's it's insane. So I kind of think that maybe he wasn't the original artist and... He was the one who just mechanized it. Gotcha. Gotcha. The models that these sisters make yeah. 
let me actually let me break down their team because okay. they all brought something different to the to the table. She's so... the fun one. <laughs> the other one's the crazy one. <laughs> the bad girl. <laughs> and she's and the she's prudent fine. one. Yeah. <laughs> It's like sex in the city. You're such a Florence. Yeah. <laughs> she's the one who's obsessed with work and can't get her life, her personal life together because all she's worried about is getting ahead at the law firm. And she's an editor for no yeah. reason. <laughs> uh, Florence did take over the business side of things. Okay. It seemed so like she was the one who was like, no, we're switching to electricity. We're going to make more money that way. Yeah. She definitely had like a mind for it. And it's the because of brain. the business brain. Yeah. It's because of Florence that we know that they were successful because Florence mm. is the one that like donated their records to the museum after like right before Shit. she died. We need one of those. How do we get a Florence for this podcast? None of us are the Florence. That's we, the problem. We need a Florence. <laughs> this is an open casting call. Yeah. For Florence. <laughs> Any Florence is listening. <laughs> so yeah, Florence has the ideas. Okay. Alice. So she's a little bit younger. Uh, Alice was a governess, but she was also a dressmaker. And so being a dressmaker means that she was really good with like fine details. Yeah. She was really good with her hands. Mm-hmm. And so she was good at making these custom mechanics for these machines. Yeah. She was also really good at making the costumes for the little figurines. Nice. And then Alice actually went to school to become a book illustrator. Oh, interesting. Which is pretty cool. That's very uh, cool. And then, you know, after her father passed, she was like, well, I'll stay at the business. She became responsible for all the scenery, props, and, like, model making. Sweet. And I'll and I'll show you some of these in a bit. Yeah. You'll see the attention to detail is just really lovely. Awesome. Um, really delicate. So, yeah, they, they work together well as a team. Sorry, real quick. You said Al- – did you say Alice twice? Did I mix did up? I? Did I just space out? Or did you I say Alice was the illustrator twice. and then Alice was the, also the dressmaker? You are right. Good call. What's the who's what's the Eveline. third one's name? Sorry. Eveline. Eveline was the illustrator. Eveline was the illustrator. Gotcha. Okay. Eveline would use Alice as a model. Oh, that's fun. So she was like, "Compose for me. I don't. I don't know how to make a face. I don't." Listen. What else is family for? I, you know how many times I grab Sarah in the middle of like her watching TV. I'll be like, "Stand over here and then point in this direction, so I can take a photo reference of how your hand looks." I have no idea how hands look. I don't have them. <laughs> They're impossible it's hard. to draw. I'm just I'm doing like this while I'm drawing and I'm like, I can't. <laughs> it's the worst. It doesn't work. You gotta take photo reference sometimes. I remember sorry, this is a tangent, but how dare um, you do a tangent on this podcast? On Alyssa? this very focused Ugh. podcast. <laughs> I was trying to draw I was draw I had to draw like a storyboard for um a project once where mm-hmm. someone who was like about to like punch, punch the yeah. camera. And yeah. I was like, I can't find a reference for this. This is not getting and so I was like, mom, come here. Come here. <laughs> so I punched my mom in the face. <laughs> no. And I was like, yeah. that's how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went back to work. <laughs> um, no, I made her pose, though. I was like, all right, I need you to act like you're hitting at someone and mm-hmm. also like you're not happy about it. Yeah. And so I just I have these really funny pictures of her just that's looking awesome. like. <laughs> yeah. Just cocking it back like she's about to throw one at you. Yeah. She she committed. I got to give her co- uh, nice. credit for that. <laughs> She's like, what do you mean you didn't clean the dishes? Oh, my gosh. <sighs> Anyways, all that to say. Yeah. You might be wondering how lucrative their business was. Uh, does it pay for itself? It does. And they are, okay. it's enough to like literally they're good. So good. it takes them about three to six months to make each machine. And wait, before I tell you how much they're making a year. I'm just going to send you a picture of one of the girls with nice. her machine. Okay. okay so this is Alice. And oh. uh, she's currently building the spook house. So the one with electricity. So cool. It, it looks like, um, have you ever seen any of the, how they make the Muppets? Like when they make the Muppet show or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, where they're like all underneath and like. Yeah, so it's like it's always all on an elevated platform. Because yeah. they have to ha- hold their hands up like this to do the puppeteering. Yeah. <laughs> So it looks like that, but like a tiny version of it with a, or it looks like it actually is a real Muppet set. And then there's a gigantic Muppet that's the size of, I don't know, a small house that just <laughs> happens to be a real person. I'm an insane person. That's how I interpret this, but it looks That fun. is how Muppets, I'm sure that's how they see God. It's fine. <laughs> it's super cool though. Yeah. So all the mechanics happen below yeah. and then the little figures on top 
or what move. So yeah, that's kind of what these models look like in terms mm -hmm. of scale and scope. And like I said, they make up they take about three to six months to make because like we said before, it's, it's not really like really elaborate. Yeah. Yeah, they're not they can't just go to like Home Depot and right. grab a kit. Like they're making all of this by hand. Yeah. They can't order it from Xi'an and have it like delivered over. <laughs> There's no Amazon Prime. Yeah. For penny arcades. There's not even like a, a Joann's down the street that they can go buy fabrics no, from or like it's Michael's. All them. <laughs> this is all them at this point. Like I said, so they're not generating a lot of models per year. It's maybe four at the most. It's all hand handmade, yeah. When they first took over in 1924, they made about mm -hmm. $83,000 that year in today's money. In today's in adjusted for inflation. Okay. Yeah. Ten years later, that grew to 170000 a year. Ooh. And then another 10 years later, right around World War II, mm -hmm. uh, we're hitting like 310000 a shit. year. Because soldiers on leave would like come to these seaside resorts and want the entertainment. That's awesome. Yeah. Are these, uh, we call them penny arcades still at this time. Are they, they don't cost a penny though still, do they? Or are they I charging do more, believe, I assume? They believe oh, they're, they're still going for a penny. Mm -hmm. So that's, so when you break that down, like $300,000. Yeah. A, a penny at a time. That's an insane amount of plays. This, and also probably why they didn't, not a lot of them survive because. Yeah. That's a lot of wear and tear. It's a lot of wear and tear. It's amazing that they even lasted as long as they did. Right. So yeah, the one there is one in particular I want to talk about that okay. has recently been restored. There was a team of restoration artists who found this. It's called Murder in the Museum. Murder. And they completely rehauled like the the electricity in it. They uh -huh. they restored it to working order and they tried to do it so that it was all like period accurate. And so Murder in the Museum exists still at the abbey house museum in england um and you can purchase a victorian penny <gasps> and like make it go nice which i will send you a link yes. so you can watch it in in action yes. and exciting. again these are like 30 to 40 seconds of motion so it's not long entertainment it's a quick little you know it's how much you would pay a penny <laughs> that's way more than a penny will get you that's true. A, pe a penny, a penny is... literally gets you nothing now. A penny is just, <laughs> we'll, we'll throw it in the trash. Like change is useless. Yeah. All right. So she puts the coin in. Oh my goodness. It looks like there's a, uh, oh, there's so much happening. Okay. So they're in a museum. There's like a mummy one. That's like a giant red thing. It looks like it's King Tut or something. Some weirdo is creeping out from behind the back. There's a bunch of, oh, what are those Buddhist statues on the top? Mm-hmm. The creep pokes out again from behind the other side. Oh, my God. Is the mummy about to come out? Oh, that's the goat. He's pointing the finger. Is he like, you're the you're the one who's going to die? Is there a cop? A cop's showing up? Oh, is he going to? He's going to kill someone, obviously, right? Whoa, the chair is spinning. Alyssa, what is going on? I don't understand. <laughs> this is so much okay, chaos at once. Let me break it down a little bit. <laughs> Who killed the man in the chair? Oh, the man in the chair is dead. The man in the chair is dead. See, gets... immediately I'm putting in more money right now. I'm just, I'm, put, I need to put <laughs> in another penny. Time. <laughs> yeah. Which I think was their intent. They're like, we need to make this so that people actually want to watch it. And yeah. there's enough detail for them to like want to watch it again. It's um, so interesting. Yeah. So each little figurine in this scene has their oh. own little movements, which yeah. is pretty Sorry, I just cool. saw the guy with the gun. Like, was yeah. it the guy with a gun? Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. Sorry. I'm going to let you talk. I'm going to stop talking. Continue. No, you're. I'm so glad you like this. Um, I love it. <laughs> yeah. So there's a man in the center of the room who's in a chair and uh, he is our our victim. There's a woman in the corner who like takes a pocket watch out of her purse and checks the time. We've got, like you said, the guy kind of creeping behind the display case, just kind of yeah, popping out. It's a weird peeping Tom guy. Yeah. And then just a random couple kind of in the middle of the room. They look very well dressed. Yeah. I don't like and, to make this reference, but one of them looks like he's the Phantom of the Opera. And then it's like some lady with like a giant fur coat. He does, though. That cape is is so ridiculous. And he's wearing a tuxedo, I think. So he literally, <laughs> he looks like the Phantom of the Opera. He wore a tuxedo to the museum. So yeah, that's right. All you musical explaining heads. Yeah, that's right. I finally made a reference to a musical in this next podcast. I thought I could go without doing it. And here it is. Alyssa, you broke me finally I of it. I did it. And you, and you referenced <laughs> Les Mis earlier. Oh, no, you're right. I did it twice. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I'm so sorry. You you oh, made no. it 
a long time without. <sighs> it's okay. We're just going to forget about that, that <sighs> comparison. I promise none of these are musical. <laughs> Not even a little bit. Just delete the whole episode. We got started over. No, I'm sorry. Continue. Find a new tab. Yeah, find a new tab, Alyssa. This is not acceptable. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so you've got this kind of crew of people, um, and then, like you said, there's a there's a sarcophagus in the corner. Yeah. And uh, the door slowly opens, and a man pops out and shoots the guy in the chair. Oh, it's a gun. I thought it was it's pointing a gun. his finger. Okay. Uh, I see. I see. I mean, it is. I'm not watching watching it too large. Also, I it's, have my it's old pretty tiny. Year old eyes. Yeah. <laughs> It's pretty tiny. And then after he shoots, a policeman comes around the corner and is like, hey. So the the guy who shoots the gun, he doesn't shoot the guy in the chair, does he? Or is that you're meant to try and figure this out? Right. So I feel like it's a little bit of a trick because when you first walk up, you don't know that there's somebody in the sarcophagus. And so you're like, okay, guy in the chair, dead. It could be anyone in this room. Who is it? Is it woman with pocket watch? Is it... (laughs) The creep in the display case. Listen, Probably that. <laughs> I'm going to go. I'm, listen, I'm just going to lean into this. It was clearly the Phantom of the Opera because he is the murderer. I'll, like, established murderer. <laughs> <laughs> with, with a rap sheet and everything. He's clearly the guy who killed him. He came to the museum opening to kill. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. That's like what's supposed to be playing in the background of this Penny Arcade. Full uh, fan service. Full fan servicing. They're going to be so happy. I'm, I have to go shower after this and wash it off. Uh, <laughs> Someday I'm, I'm going to ask you more about your musical opinions, but I'm letting you recover. <laughs> Maybe season two. Season two, yeah. I'll be like, it'll be enough of a, I'll, it'll be in the past and I'll be yeah. like, okay. It's still, so the was, wounds are too fresh right now. That was a different person. A yeah, different it was life. a different person then, a different <laughs> life. Yeah. So anyway, okay. So back to murder in the museum. Yeah. Like I said, this machine is kind of, it's really special in that like it's in working order now. You can still go see it. I actually found the blog of the people who did the restoration effort. Nice. Oh, Um, do they do process stuff? Yeah. So they they (gasps) said, I think it's funny that you said you couldn't see a gun. And I wonder if this is, the video was taken before that because the gun did go missing at some point and the restoration team was like, Oh my God. We have to make a tiny gun because it just looks like he's pointing at this guy. <laughs> like, it's not that exciting. It's literally Chekhov's gun. They're like, we introduced it. Now we, it can't not be in there by the end. We have to reintroduce, we have to pay off the gun that's in there in the beginning. He, you can't point someone to death. Like, yeah. You could, I mean, you could just be like, I curse you and then that's true. You die from a curse of some sort. That's true. Okay. It could be a little more supernatural. Yeah. You got to make sure that you share that uh, link so I can put it in the show notes. Absolutely. Uh, so that people can see the process. I'd love to look at that too. Obviously, I won't look at it now because we're recording, okay. but I'm fascinated to see that. Yeah, it's it's cool. It's definitely on a blog from like the early 2000s. Yeah, blogger. <laughs> you're just like, is this real? And then you're like, oh, yeah, it, it is. But <laughs> it's on a forum called Penny Arcade Forum. Okay. So there's a, there's a whole world that i did not realize existed so the restoration team said that while they were working on this they were like this is basically the rolls royce of the genre compared to other machines at the time because everything is so intricate and everything is just like timed perfectly and that Mm -hmm. was one of the biggest challenges of restoring it was like okay this person has to move and then the gun comes out and then a light bulb goes off to do the flash of the gun and then there's yeah. like a spring snaps to to simulate the sound of a gun and like all these have to work very well together in a small space mm-hmm. um so they did have a hard time with it this is like it feels like a small scale of something like i don't know like it's a small world almost yeah no pun intended of double small but like it's all you're meant to when you reach a certain point in the ride it does a certain action yeah, yeah, it's very much or Pirates um, of the Caribbean, basically. That's like yeah, kind of like the animatronic, larger. yeah, for sure. Yeah, I kind of i I like to think that this was kind of the predecessor. It's very yeah, it feels very Disney, like predecessor to Disneyland. I'm sure right. Walt Disney saw this at some point and was like, "These are awesome." How do we make these into birds? <laughs> How do I make money off of this? Yeah, <laughs> done. <laughs> yeah, pretty pretty wild. I did think it was really funny. This museum that did the restoration is yeah. very proud of this machine and they made a 15 minute short film based on it it's hilarious uh is it about the process of make of restoring it or just like pretending that the thing 
Oh my God, I got to see that too. <laughs> it's pretending that the scene happened and like speculating what happened and i will tell you after like two minutes of watching this i was like no wonder that guy got shot oh he was being everyone awful. hated him oh no it's like uh whatchamacallit which one was it <laughs> hercule perot <laughs> yeah which one yeah. which i forget which one is that it's like everyone was the sus everyone they couldn't figure oh, out what the suspect was it yeah, turns out everyone it was killed like him murder on the murder on the orient express yes i was like it yes. could be any of them because he was being a jerk to all of them. Huge dick. Totally deserved to die. Huge dick. Only one sitting down, complaining about things running late, Shh. being so Dickhead. mean. So Never worked finally... in the service industry. Has no idea what's happening None. behind the scenes. Is mad that a woman is giving a presentation at one point. Oh, he's a misogynist too. Yeah. Just the worst. <sighs> Terrible. So when Deserves Sar- to die. Yeah. it's my, I was like, oh, I'm not that bummed out about this anymore. <laughs> Murder uh, solved. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll, I'll include that, too. It's kind of, it's, they stretched 40 sec- seconds into 15 minutes, so it's long. Listen, that's basically this podcast, but stretched to like an hour and a half. It's true. I read this article, and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Three minutes stretched out to an hour and 45. Listen, people seem to stay, stick around for it. Thank you for continuing to stick around. Yeah, audience. we appreciate you. So, yeah, that is Murder... In the museum, that was one of their big ones, and nice. like I said, they they worked through the end of World War II, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in 1944, the Denison sisters decide it's time for us to sell. We're ready to like enjoy the rest of our lives, kind of a leisure, and we're kind of done with the business. And so they end up selling all of their machines to the Blackpool Tower, and from there, the company kind of disperses them around the world. And they largely disappear. Like, a lot of them fall into disrepair. A lot of them... Lame. We don't know where they went. But when they do resurface, they are major collector items now uh, because they are so rare. And, like, machines at that point have started to be more mass-produced, less uh-huh. less intricate. So yeah. finding these machines is really special because they're so unique. And one thing I thought was annoying and why I wanted to focus on the Denison sisters mm-hmm. <laughs> is that... All the models they make, like half the time, are attributed to their dad. Uh, okay. So they're very much kind of swept under the rug. Um, That's lame. It'll be like, this is a John Dennison piece from 1940. And I'm like, no, it's not. Is it? <laughs> he died. You're like, I know he liked morbid things, but he didn't come back from the dead and make these things. Right. <laughs> Give credit. 16 so, yeah. years after his death or 20 years after his death. That's pretty oh, lazy. Yeah. That's right? the bare amount of reporting. They were just like, Denison, probably that John guy. Probably that John guy. Women can't do mechanics. Women aren't engineers. Yeah. How are they going to make one of these penny arcades when they're in the kitchen? <laughs> With no pennies. With no pennies. They don't even, how do they get a penny? They don't even work. We didn't give it to them. <laughs> so yeah, uh, like I said, major collector items. The last one I found that sold went for about $36,000. Oh, wow. And that was like in 2016, I want to say. Okay. So, uh, yeah, they are very cool when people do come across them. But yeah. And collectors like definitely know their significance. Yeah, that's the, the sisters kind of take a step back from public life. And yeah. uh, Florence, like I said, is the one who donates her notebooks and like her financial records to the museum mm-hmm. before she dies. And so it's kind of the only evidence we have now that of all the work they did. That's insane. Yeah. So yeah, that is uh, the Dennis and sisters and their contribution to the penny arcade. I, I just thought it was really cool. And I loved seeing the models and amazing detail. I, well, I yeah. Get, incredible. I will keep sending you stuff. Yeah. 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 I was going to say, is this something where they can just go, the audience can go uh, do a quick Google search of um, Penny Arcade Dennis Denison Sisters or something like that. Or they can, and they'll probably find mostly pictures from Murder in the Museum because okay. it is, like I said, the best restored one that we have. So I just sent you a few. Yeah. Oh man, that sarcophagus is so cool. It kind of almost looks like an old timey Coca Cola fridge too. It does. It's like Maybe bright we're... red. <laughs> They're like, can we just repurpose this? I can think of like. Four people off the top of my head that I know who would personally be obsessed with this and try and make oh, something yeah? like this. Yeah. 
That's living in LA, like and being uh, f- being within the film industry for and you. Being like, still. yeah, around creative people yeah. who are good at making I'm this like, stuff. Yep, I know at least a couple people that would just be like, "I'm gonna do this now." Yeah, yeah, and like um, Eveline, she was the art school one. She um, yeah, the youngest, right? Yeah, she she really was like, I want these to feel more like fine scale miniatures than like small versions of the things. Be- so there's there's like a whole. Uh, classification of what makes a fine scale miniature versus Mm -hmm. just like a small reproduction and so she really strove to like get those details in and make sure they were accurate and to scale and i think it shows like you yeah it's really gorgeous and alice the dressmaker said that it was challenging to like make the clothes so that they looked good when they were moving yeah because it's one thing to make them stationary but then yeah you gotta um, give them room yeah yeah, so like designing for a this very This jacket tiny... <laughs> needs a raglan cut. You can't just do a standard jacket on this. It's a good raglan cut mention. Good job. I've been waiting until 37 <laughs> episodes to slip in a raglan cut reference. Finally. Finally the, finally the appropriate time. Today was the day. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that kind of, I hope that wasn't too short, but that was my tab. That was. No, you went, it was perfect amount of time, actually. Was it good? Okay. It was fantastic. Thank you, Alyssa. That was wonderful. I really, really enjoyed seeing those. And I'm looking forward to watching the 15 minute doc, like the the fake whodunit. I will warn uh, you, it is a silent film. Like they don't, there's no sound and they just have title cards in it. Even, Even better, though... I can watch it on the couch while somebody it's else true. is watching something. I don't have to disrupt them because I'm not yeah. a monster who plays speakerphone really loud while other people are doing things. Those people can be burned. I don't. I agree. I can't. Take you and put you in the guillotine <laughs> and chop your heads off. That's that's. We should make that one. We should make like this. The What was the title of the guillotine one? It was the French uh, Revolution. The French one. Execution. Yeah. So this should be like the speakerphone execution. So it's like somebody yes. who gets their head chopped off with guillotine while their phone's playing something on speakerphone and then it like falls into the basket and then someone picks it up and then breaks the phone or something. I don't know. And they're like, you're welcome, society. Yeah. I would, people would pay money to watch I someone's head get chopped off for being on speakerphone. It's so loud. I hate yeah. them. Uh, no, but that was fantastic. Thank you. That was excellent. Of course. Um, Thanks. Hannah I'm, is going to be so annoyed it. that she didn't get to see this. She's going to be super jealous. Yes. That, that was all I actually really wanted was... you. <laughs> with flying colors i'm not just saying that oh, thank you that's kind that was my my deep dive into the oh and like i said i did try to find them on ancestry.com because i was like i want to know oh, more right, about right. these sisters i want to know like what they did after or did they ever marry did they ever have families it kind of seems like they didn't but um again dedicated really, their life to it <laughs> yeah they were really uh committed to the craft okay god yeah. bless them salute Salute to the Denison sisters. And I'm psyched to hear what you have. Thank you. Um, okay. So my tab, it's fall now. It's officially fall. Mm. Summer's <laughs> over. I can finally apply my pumpkin spice beard oil, which is a thing that exists. Do you have that? I don't have it. No, I'm not a monster. But <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> I don't I wasn't gonna yuck your yum. <laughs> Please don't use pumpkin spice beard oil. That's just, just <laughs> die. Just, that's another one. Just no more pumpkin spice. Guillotine. Uh, guillotine. Uh, <laughs> fall. Fall also means that it's closer to the election. Yay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In the notes I wrote, hold for groans. Um, <laughs> and uh, once again, it's entirely too close and it makes me angry. And uh, you know, you know how everyone's always threatening to move to Canada. They're always like, "If Trump gets elected, I'm going to move to Canada. That's it. I'm done." Mm-hmm. Yep, it's a popular no, line. Yeah, no one ever does, of course. No. Um, and I always wondered, like, what is their plan exactly when they go? Because I don't think people really think past that. Like, have how you, do you make money? Have you ever thought had this thought of like, I'll just, I'll just move to a different country? I mean, I've I've considered the thought. I mean, I've had the thought and then I've sort of continued the thought and then been like, there's no option for me. You've uh, done more work than most people. Yes. I've, I've looked tr- into yeah. it at different points, not necessarily <laughs> just because of like a fascist dictator taking over, mm, but also yeah. just, you know, I'm not necessarily tied to the idea of having to stay in the U.S. forever. It'd be like, oh, it'd be fun if New Zealand would hire me for some sort of work. I'd go live in New Zealand for a few years, you know, Heck I'd go yeah. live in wherever. Like, I'm not. I'm not uh, opposed to any of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
unfortunately, my <laughs> Iranian citizenship provides me nothing in terms of like <laughs> being more favorable to go anywhere else. <laughs> no advantage. <laughs> no advantage whatsoever. So whatever, it doesn't matter. But um, I always think like when you go to Canada, like what are you really going to do? And the first thing I yeah. thought of was like, I guess you would just be like a maple syrup producer or something <laughs> like yeah. that sounds nice. It does sound nice. Probably um, smells good. Probably smells good. But hey, guess what? Apparently, that shit sucks and is super duper regulated. <laughs> what? It's not cozy and lovely? No. Uh, okay. That's not just my American bias. Apparently, people in Canada, a lot of them think it sucks too. Oh. <laughs> Especially some of the producers themselves. And they thought it sucked so much that in the year 2012, a small group of them got together and stole... 540,000 gallons of maple syrup over the course of a year worth $18 million. What? It's a lot of, it's a lot of waffles. Yep. Oh my and God. Okay. All right. They would, they would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for those pesky kids. I knew that they were involved. <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry. Okay. Incredible. The, okay. I can't wait for this. So come with me, eh? Yeah. As I regale eh? you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my spiced <laughs> apple. I'm wearing my flannel. I tried to dress Canadian today. It's honestly, not, it's yeah, warm. it's good. It's so warm, dude. You said it was fall, but it's fall, but it doesn't feel like fall. I had to we're turn off LA my air conditioning. Fire, and yeah, yeah. I want to die. <laughs> it's so hot. <laughs> so come with me as I regale okay. you with the tale of the great Canadian maple syrup heist. Oh, I mean, I'm already, I'm on board. Here we go. You're on board. What makes maple syrup different from your store-bought cheapo stuff like Aunt Jemima? Do you know? I'm guessing it doesn't have high fructose corn syrup in it. That's correct. Oh, sweet. I was just guessing. No, that's right. Yeah, it's not. Okay. If you're a yank, you just assume that it's like it's all the same. But no, because everything that's sugar is corn syrup in this country. When mm -hmm. you go north, that's not the case. It's actually sap from okay. maple trees. As God intended. As God intended. <laughs> How do they get that sap out? If my TikTok videos that I watch. Oh, you watch TikTok videos on how they get sap out of trees? If, if, if it's any indication, do they like hammer like it's, it looks like a straw thing and like the sap comes out? Yes. That's okay. how they used to do it, actually. That's that All was right. originally how it was. Also, back in the old days, it was strictly halal where a Muslim had to perform the slaughter in the appropriate ritual manner with the tree's throat being cut by a sharp knife, severing the carotid artery, jugular vein, and windpipe in a single swipe, and then all the sap had to be drained out of the tree carcass. But that's not <laughs> how they do it anymore, because every day we stray further and further from God. <laughs> okay. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's actually... No, that's true. I made all that up. Uh, but, oh, I thought it was... Yes. It's not actually halal. That's a total uh, I I believed joke. you 100%. <laughs> Uh, it's it's a thing called sap tubing, and I'm sending you some pictures sap right tubing. now. Sap tubing. Sap tubing. That sounds like a like a it's snowboarding move. It, it's exactly what you would think if you think about sap tubing. Weird. This looks like um like someone put like hamster tubes all around <laughs> the forest. <laughs> <laughs> See, my brain goes. It almost looks like they're trying to inject like adamantium into the trees and turn them into like Weapon X, a.k.a. Wolverine, who's a very famous Canadian. That's true. <laughs> Do you remember that scene in uh, in the Weapon X movie? I I don't, but I can see it. There's also a very it. famous, uh, I think it's Barry Windsor Smith who did the book. I, I Don't quote me. I'm pretty sure it's Barry Windsor Smith who did the Wolverine, but the Weapon X book about how they turned okay. Logan into Wolverine because mm. he had the claws, but he didn't have the adamantium in his skeleton. So the government basically sticks it all and injects it into his body. And then he's got all these crazy tubes coming from him. Uh, okay. I went comic book when I thought about it. Anyway, yeah, I just want to talk you, about Wolverine. You went way more um, not realistic, but that's always how I, it's more insane. Uh, yeah. Morbid. <laughs> yeah. Morbid. And so then I was thinking about like a tree Wolverine who's got like adamantium inside of him and it's like got yes. healing power, kind of oh. like a cross between Wolverine and a uh, tree beard. Man, I kind of wish all trees had that. Me too. I mean, they do in some level, but you know, yeah. poor, poor tree Wolverine's physical wounds may heal, but his emotional scars never will. They're forever. <laughs> and ironic how, with how Logan ends, which I won't say, but yeah, he turns into a tree actually into a he maple tree. He turns into a tree beard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in case you haven't seen it. Spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> anyways, it's wacky, right? It's totally crazy. And yeah. these tubes that are all plugged into it, like you said, it, it looks like pipes, like under a house. Yeah. 
like a like plumbing. Yeah, or like somebody's really silly straw. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so these tubes, they they drain it, they transfer the sap directly from the trees into the nearby sugar shack, which yes, that's the actual name. I don't know if that's great. <laughs> Listen, they're okay, Canadian. They, they're they got the alliteration. I, exactly. I can appreciate that. Okay. Sugar Shack, baby, Sugar Shack. Eh, eh, like the B fifty twos. Oh yeah, I like it. Yeah. It uh, almost works. It almost. It's almost a good joke, but not quite. <laughs> now, in these sugar shacks, it goes into these giant tanks, where they go through reverse osmosis, which is basically making it super concentrated by sifting out all of like the water and extra stuff, and then that concentrated pure shit is heated up and browned. And the next thing you know, you got yourself some pure grade Quebecois maple syrup. Ooh, okay. They sell it for prime money, I'm guessing. Prime cash. Actually, yeah. one interesting fact before we get into all that uh, that I thought was interesting is uh, the sap's character is different depending on how late in the season you milk the trees and the oh. to get it out. <laughs> I'm learning so much about trees. <laughs> Adamantium, <laughs> nipples, all kinds Who of stuff. Who knew? <laughs> it's amazing. So if you get the sap out earlier in the season, it's lighter. But if you wait later in the season, it becomes darker. Interesting. Do and, they, f- and they taste different? They do. And there's four classes of maple syrup. Golden, amber, dark, and very dark. <laughs> they kind of lost steam at the end. Yeah, they're just like, ah, very dark, sure. Dark. Well, uh, but this one's darker. Very yeah, I dark. S- Done. I sent you a picture of it. You can take a look. So it's like yellow, orangey, and then like brown almost. Oh, this would be a fun. This would be a great gift set. It would be actually. Yeah. I, I was thinking it's a lot like beer. Yeah. Yeah. It looks. So amber, dark, you know, golden. IPA. The IPA. So I was like, it makes me think there's undoubtedly like an insufferable class of bearded Canadian guy who only consumes very dark syrup and has made it his entire personality. I guarantee that exists. Yeah. <laughs> I guarantee that exists in America. <laughs> oh, like a, like a very dark syrup guy? Yeah. I only oh. drink very dark syrup oh. from Canada. Oh, yeah. please. Guillotine. They exist. Guillotine. Guillotine in the Penny Arcade. <laughs> um, that was just a little bit of fun facts about how uh, maple syrup's made. I thought that was fun and interesting. Unsurprisingly, since we're dealing with trees and crops, maple syrup production can vary from year to year because it's based on the trees. So mm-hmm. if it's too hot or cold... The yield will change. Some years you'll get a shit ton, and other years you'll get jack shit. Those okay. are the two scales: shit ton or jack shit. There's no middle. <laughs> yeah, there's no middle. And Great. maple syrup is a very big industry that makes a lot of money for our neighbors in the north. So in 2022, Canadian exports of maple products amounted to 616 million dollars, so more than a half billion. Whoa! Just for maple syrup. So. The stereotype kind of is, exists for a reason, then. I mean, it's literally on the flag. Yeah, they put the yeah. leaf there. It's like a whole <laughs> yeah. thing. It's like they're that's, proud of it. They're proud of it. It's their deal. Yeah. Uh, it makes them a good chunk of change. It's pretty much the only place. I, I forget. I forgot to look. I forgot to write down the number. But it's something like ninety-three percent of syrup or maple syrup, like all comes from, wow, uh, from like Quebec and from Canada in general. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you got to make sure. That the money keeps flowing because there's like a whole industry and, you know, like you said, like national pride about it. You can't yeah. mess around with it. The, uh, the the Maple Boys all got together and they came up with a plan. The Maple Boys. <laughs> yes. In 19... <laughs> yeah, right. Maple <laughs> Boys with a giant leaf on the back. I would wear that, that actually. That Shit. sounds awesome. <sighs> Damn it. I keep coming up with merch. It's the worst. I know. It's easy to do. Hard to, to make. make it. <laughs> yeah. Hard to make. Easy to come up with. Yeah. And it'll probably just go to, uh, what was the dad's name again? I forgot his name. Um, John Dennison. John Dennison will probably get credit for making that jacket, even though I was the one who came up with it. Because everything yeah. goes back to credit to John Dennison. He made everything. And you're just lucky to be one of his daughters. <laughs> Excellent raglan cut Maple Boys jacket, John Dennison. Yes. <laughs> you nailed it, John. So uh, in 1966... They founded the Federation of Maple Syrup Producers, which sadly does not tie into Star Trek, but a boy can dream. Maybe someday. Maybe someday they'll incorporate that into one of the shows. Um, That'd be amazing. <laughs> together, the producers establish policies, negotiate their selling strategy, and enforce production quotas. So it's basically like OPEC, except with maple syrup. 
So they've taken the fun out of maple syrup. They've taken the fun out of maple syrup. I like to call it OSEP, if you will, which is <laughs> Organization of the Syrup Exporting Producers. That's a Not way the official name. name, but that's what I called it. Yeah. Instead of the Federation, which makes yeah. me confused and think I'm on Star Trek. But yeah. Um, I like I like OSEP. It's better. OSEP's much more fun. It's so it's controversial, but okay. it's not necessarily a bad thing when you sort of break down why it's there. So it's not uncommon amongst growers and farmers and whatnot to do this kind of thing. Uh-huh. So everyone gets together and they decide we're only going to have like 10 million gallons a year of of uh, of syrup to go out, and the market's set. That's like the okay. sort of annual number they came up with. And if one year they collectively produce 20 million gallons. That extra 10 mil is taken and put into the Global Strategic Reserve of Maple Syrup. I was like, is there extra? (laughs) Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. It's basically their Fort Knox. I want this. They bank it and they save it till the next year or like a year, a couple of years because the maple syrup will last. Um, and like like you said, it's they can't really predict if it's going to be a good yield. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. You have no way of knowing because it depends on the weather. Also, by the okay. way, side conspiracy, Canadian banks are all going to collapse because they no longer use a currency backed by maple syrup. So get ready for that. Take all your money out of the banks because they don't back it with syrup. I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> Unrelated. So maybe the following year, uh, everyone only produces 5 million gallons, right? Okay. And then you're like, shit, we haven't hit the quota of 10 million, but no problem. You just bust out five mil from the reserves that you saved the year before and everything's Gucci. Markets stay stable. There's no like, you know, supply chain shortage or whatever. Yeah. There's no like syrup inflation, any of that kind of crap. It's, it is on paper at least like a very prudent thing to do and it makes sense. Yeah. It makes total sense. I'm, I'm here for it. Yeah. But not everyone, not everyone likes to be prudent. They're not into it. I imagine. Some people, they want to be in charge of their own destiny. <laughs> and they worked hard and they got more sap. They don't want to okay. turn it over to OSEP, like some sort of OSAP. Okay, that was very well done. <laughs> Thank you. The American way of thinking starts to seep in. Oh, sorry, guys. Like, yeah, they're like, you're not the king of England. Get your damn hands off my syrup, you s- syrup. I don't know. <laughs> Some producers, some syrup producers have been known to slang barrels of syrup that, quote, fell off the back of the truck on the black market, which I assume is like the Best Buy parking lot. But it has to be. Yeah. (laughs) It's Trader Joe's. It's Trader Joe's. And they're like, listen, all you dumpster divers come in the back. I got you some syrup. Great A. Very dark. Laced with pumpkin because it's the (laughs) fall. We know you Americans love it. But the Federation does not play at all. If you're even suspected of doing something like that, they'll send bodyguards to watch your area 24-7, like you and your sugar shacks, and you have to pay for them. What? (laughs) This is so serious. Oh, it's not a joke. It's insane. You can also get randomly inspected or audited. Like, they'll just show up and be like, show me all your receipts. Show me all the records for this. What's the deal here? It's kind of like a, they keep referring to it as like a cartel. This is wild for yeah. syrup. Just okay. for syrup. This is gotta very intense. Al- yeah, you got to always have your ducks in a row. There's literally, it's this feels more strict than the Iran nuclear deal, honestly. It, it just feels like totally I, over the top. Yeah, I think that was maybe less security. Damn. They're like, meanwhile, we got like, a, we're enriching uranium. And they're like, they're not interested in that. Do you have syrup that you're selling on the black market? <laughs> That's fine. I just, I smell some maple. <laughs> That's what's dangerous. Ooh. So- Tension is boiling, has been boiling over since like the early 2000s. And shit's been getting more and more tense between the producers and the Federation. Again, not Star Trek. (sighs) Every time. The the stuff that goes into the surplus, like the the people who produce, is it just like all at that point divvied up among everyone? Uh, You're you're saying in terms of how it gets sold? That's a good question. I don't know, actually. Like, are they seeing the profits if they, if their company produced more than the other? Or does it literally go into a big, I assume, barrel? And (laughs) they're like, no, this is ours now and we will release it. You know what? Profit off of it. I don't, I don't actually know in terms of how it's divvied up amongst. I don't know if like each producer is expected. I, maybe each producer is like, okay, you can give us I'm guessing, totally guessing okay. here. I have no idea, but I wonder if it's something like 
depending on the size of your land and what your average yield is and how much okay you could just be like okay i usually produce like whatever 10 barrels a year and then they'll be like okay so we're expecting you but if you do 12 barrels i, d- I actually don't know that's a really good question i didn't okay get into that aspect of it that's okay um if you guys know who are listening please go ahead and send it to us at 500 open tabs at gmail.com if you have information so the producers are getting pissed. They're getting like, don't tread on me, maple leaf tattoos. They're reading a lot of Ayn Rand. They're believing in objectivism. <laughs> oh, no. And they're like, I'll be master <laughs> of my own destiny. And then there's a revolt. And there's like footage of them being like, so there's these inspectors going to look at like one dude's thing, like his his sugar shack. And then all of a sudden, all these other ones show up and they're like, get away. Like, you can't come in here and inspect. Like standing, like they're doing protests. Oh, my gosh. They're like, okay. shit, we're going to rally together and block you. It gets nuts, yeah. And at one point, three different Federation leaders had their sugar shacks burned down in the span of two weeks. Burned down. <laughs> Woo, they're not there's playing. No, there's no proof. They couldn't figure out who did it, so it's not necessarily a person who was one of the producers, but mighty suspicious. It seems pretty coincidental that that would happen. Whack attack. Yeah, okay. Very very sus, as very, they would say. Very sus. On the morning of July 30th, 2012, an accountant named Michel Javreau arrived at the Strategic Reserve to do the Federation's annual inventory check-in. This part was funny because apparently the barrels are all stacked super high and they're so heavy from the syrup that everyone just climbs them like a tree. Um, And I'm going to send you a picture of what they look like. Okay. Have you watched all of Breaking Bad? I've watched half of it. Half of it? Okay. Yeah. I get uh, I get about halfway through season three and then I get sad. <laughs> it's just, it's sad. I just mean like if you have seen it, it's like the methylamine and like the labs oh that they God. have with like all this crazy. It's just like that's what it looks like. It looks like this, something out of Breaking Bad. It doesn't look real. It looks like you like copy and pasted a bunch of white barrels in like a 3D software. That's all syrup. That's all syrup. Wow. Okay. It looks like the end of Indiana Jones where they're like in the thing, but just it's all syrup instead of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, So it's they're super heavy, too. So they each one of them weighs about 600 pounds when they have all of the syrup in them. So when Michelle is there, he's doing his inventory, right? Just like standard, whatever. I'm just checking them. It's annual. Just making sure stuff's here, whatever, blah, 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 blah. And he goes to climb and like go to like, I don't know, like one of the top ones. And one of the barrels slips out from underneath his feet and he just slips and he's shit and he falls over. And this is supposed to be a 600 pound barrel. Exactly. He's just like, what the hell? Okay. So he opens it up and it's empty. There's nothing in it. Oh, he's just like, what? Something hinky is happening here. (laughs) Something is, something's not right, eh? Yeah. And (laughs) I'm sorry, Canada. (laughs) I'm sorry, Canada. Uh, Sorry. (laughs) Are you mad at me? Please don't be I, mad at me. They're I'm so sorry. mad. They're so mad at us. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> um, anyway, and it's empty, right? It, but uh-huh. not just that one. A bunch more of them. So he goes to his bosses at the Federation, and he's like, "What's going on here? Did you do you guys know about this?" Blah blah blah. blah. And they're like, oh, "What?" And so an investigation begins, and suddenly, like, syrup cops show up, bunch of mounties on like mooses. <laughs> they fly in like Celine Dion and like William Shatner to help with the investigation and like other leading Canadians. All so hands that, are on deck. Amazing. Their badges all have like maple leaves on them. And, like, <laughs> It's a big deal. Uh, I think it's like, if I'm not mistaken, it's like one of the biggest investigations like in Canadian police history. Uh, and Whoa. certainly in Quebec. It's like the biggest thing that's ever happened because it's a lot of money. And it's that's like their money. biggest industry. Part of me is like, uh, I, I'm glad that this is like, their historical note that it's not something that's like way worse, but I don't know. Oh, right. Like genocide. Yeah. Or like, like, yeah. Okay. This, uh, we sold arms to the Nazis. This could be a lot worse. It's, it's syrup. That's true. It's true. Syrup's not that it's a good, it's a good one to be proud of too. Yeah. 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 So the investigation begins. Okay. And they question over 200 people, which eventually led to a dozen and change arrests. This okay. pipeline was vast. The The night watchman guy was in on it. There's like a truck driver that's in on it. There's all of these different people that were part of the operation. Oh, my gosh. But it basically came down to three main dudes. First up, Richard Valier. He was the ringleader. Valier. Valier. <laughs> might as well do it again. He's like Jean Valjean. 
uh, Richard Jean Valjean. Just you're full of them this time. <laughs> Get them all out in this episode. <laughs> so that when Alyssa, when Hannah comes back, she's just gonna be like, "What?" I'm like, "I don't know what you're talking about. I never did this." That didn't happen. So Richard, old Dick, he's known as what you would call a barrel roller. Barrel roller, Dick Valier. Okay, so incredible. Y- you know how we all got that like one low key kind of criminal cousin, right? He's like. He's your cousin and you love him and he sort of has like a moral compass around the family. But like the times between the holiday gatherings, you have no idea what kind of like like questionable shit he's up to. Yeah. You don't even know what state they're in. You don't even know what he's doing. But then he shows up at Thanksgiving. He's like, really? He's like, hey, so nice to see you. You love him because you guys you grew up together. Yeah. It's Um, great to see him. You just don't even know any other details. Yeah. His heart's sort of in the right place. But like, he's also not at all. I don't know. It's it's debatable. Yeah. That's this guy. That's Valier. Valier is the cousin. Okay. So old Just like Dick, a little bit shady. Little, um, this guy is very shady based on what okay. the laws are. But he kind of sees himself as like a as like a Robin Hood type character almost. Old Dick, he's slinging black market rum. Rup. Sorry. Black market rup. Like syrup. Rup. rup. Oh. <laughs> did you come up with that shortening? I, I I I thought I did. I don't know. It might have been something that's on the internet before, but it just It's was, great. Thank you. The Rup. Yeah. The Rup. He's slanging it to a guy named Etienne Saint Pierre, who So French. It was a syrup exporter based out of Ottawa. Okay. So he's like Art Vandelay, a reference no one under 35 will get. But I got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he wants to focus less on the importing and then adjust more to the exporting. <laughs> yes. It's our second Seinfeld reference in like two weeks. That's great. Yeah. I'm so glad you got it. Oh, I love, uh, I love Seinfeld. That's his job. But he's he's doing a different thing over in Ottawa. He's just exporting. He's not doing anything illegal at this time necessarily. That's just like his business. Okay. Because okay. Ottawa has got a different, or which I'll get into. So, And lastly, there's Avic Caron, who's a man with ties to the mob who owned the warehouse. So I get, this is again, I I wasn't able to figure this out in time. I'm not sure how much more deep I would have to get to it, but I guess all the Federation syrup isn't stored in one area necessarily. Like there's not one main building where it always lives. Okay. At least not in the case for this this specific robbery. So in 2011, uh, the Federation approaches Caron and they're like, can we use your warehouse for storing them? And Caron's like, hell yeah, baby, store as much as you want here. Let's do it. I don't know why, but I don't know if it's overflow. I think I got the impression that it was most of it, but it, maybe it was overflow of the overflow. I don't know. Maybe it's safety precaution. They yeah. Have, you know, all, all of their in goods place. in one spot. Yeah. That would be smart if they did that, but yeah, maybe not. I Although do. I don't know if how flammable maple syrup is. Maybe it's highly flammable. I haven't looked into it. Or it's highly sealable. And... It's highly sealable. Certainly. Yeah. More questions than answers as we're, uh, as we go further into this case. <laughs> Essentially, this is how it goes down. This is how it gets stolen. And it's not all at once, don't forget. Over the course of that year, the crew got a batch of barrels that were nearly identical to the Federation ones stored in Coron's warehouse. Okay? Okay. And these were, think of them as the dummy barrels, complete with corresponding inventory stickers with barcodes and all that crap, just in case someone from the Federation happened to come by and was just like looking through. Okay. This is smart. Yeah. So they got decoy barrels. They, they'd go and they'd take their decoy barrels and they'd temporarily swap them out with the Federation barrels, like the actual ones that have the maple syrup ones. And okay. they would take the Federation barrels to a nearby warehouse. And there they would siphon all of the syrup out of the Federation barrels into a third kind of like normie looking non-Federation style barrel. Okay. Because you don't want to draw suspicion if you have the Federation barrel, the one that looks like a Federation barrel. So it's like, let's just say it's like a red barrel for the sake of the story. Right. After those get emptied, the Uh Federation barrels, meaning the original ones with the syrup, they took those barrels to a nearby creek and filled them with creek water so they wouldn't be empty and then brought them back to the warehouse and returned them to their original spots in the stacks and then took back their dummy Federation ones and left. Oh, my gosh. Okay. This is the perfect crime. You got it? So yeah. it's three barrels. There's the three barrels. Federation barrel, there's the decoy barrel, and then there's like the normie, whatever, red one, where the Federation barrels uh, maple syrup ended up going into. The profit barrel. That's called the profit barrel, even better. <laughs> now, 
because the Federation controls the sale of syrup in Quebec, they can't do anything with them there. So they took the profit barrel. They took all the gooey, gooey, goo goo across the border to New Brunswick, where it was no longer under their jurisdiction. <laughs> So they're smuggling the oil in these profit <laughs> barrels in the heat of the night to another area where there's freedom. Oh my gosh, I love this. Okay, they were smart about this. They were pretty smart. I mean, for the most part. Yeah. Um, and they got caught, but and then they yeah, when they got caught, you're like, it's not very smart. But mm. uh, there, once they get to New Brunswick, they packaged it into smaller batches, and then it was handed off. And sold to both legitimate buyers like Etienne, who was over in Ottawa, uh, amongst okay. other people, and also to black market exporters. So, and then from Wild. there it goes into like the U.S. Some of it's in Canada. I want to say that it was somewhere in East Asia. Maybe China is where it goes. I can't remember. Or Japan, one of those Dang. countries in East Asia. I forget where it went. But there's only like a couple places that it went to. Now, the haul was big, and they do no, do it all at once because remember each time it's like 600 pounds. Yeah, at like- least. That's a lot to... Yeah. 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 Assuming however many barrels that they do at a time. And, you know, this thing takes a while, so they got to take it and empty it. I don't imagine that transferring uh, no. uh, syrup is a very quick process. It's not a, known to be a quick liquid. No. And then you turn it upside down, and then you got to leave it to make sure each one of the last drops of it come out. <laughs> the handle's all sticky. You're like... This yeah. Is oh, that's the worst. That's the worst part of it. <laughs> So they're doing it over the course of a year, months and months, and they're thinking, okay, they're making money. It's going well. They're paying off, you know, whoever the, like I said, the night guard, Billy Bob, the night guard, he's chilling. He's in on it now. So during the day, he's, <laughs> he's during the <laughs> he's day, he's working farmer. for the better. Yeah. <laughs> you ever put uh, maple syrup on cheese curds? They're so delicious. Okay. But like, that might be something. Maybe might have invented that too today by accident. Yeah, I could see that being a thing, like the sweet and the savory. I could work. You put a little spot, hot sauce on it too, or just like some peppers. Give yes. it a little, you gotta have the sweet, spicy, and the salty. That's usually the key. Yeah, it's it's kind of like putting like honey on cheese, but yeah, yeah, or like pizza. Yeah. A lot of people put hot honey on cheese now. That's a big oh, thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good it's stuff. basically just the same thing. You put maple syrup uh, poutine. I'm gonna go put some uh, maple yeah. syrup on my mac and cheese tonight. Listen, <laughs> let's. Those of you who are listening. Send, show, show us your pictures of maple syrup on whatever weird food that you've eaten. Post it in the Discord. So anyway, they're sort of it's trickling out, no pun intended, like a sap. Basically, like you said, it's a pretty smart way of doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's pretty clever in terms of how they pulled it off, but they foolishly left behind a couple of clues that would lead the investigators to figure out who was behind it and catch them. First up, the creek water that they put into the barrels that they swapped out. Remember the decoy barrels yeah. were put there and then they, they filled the real barrels with water so that it had weight in it. Okay. I'm guessing that the Go creek ahead. water, like they were able to like find out what creek it was from. Yes. So I think, so first of all, they figured out it was creek water because it's a bunch of creek water and it started to rust <laughs> the barrel. Oh. Right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you look at those barrels, they're all like, Pristine. pristine they're perfectly white because yeah as far as i know you know syrup doesn't like rust things right it's not corrosive <laughs> yeah it's not corrosive so they're kind of like okay is there somewhere nearby that like there's a creek maybe that someone could have done like saying so it's sort of they're like okay are there they would have to go to like a warehouse maybe like to do this they wouldn't be doing it here mm-hmm. um, again because to them it was like well this is a convenient thing we'll just go to this creek that's right by our warehouse fill it up with water pop it in and you're trying to do it as quickly as you can without being sloppy which unfortunately they were the crucial turning point of the case do you want to know what it was Yes. You want to take a guess what you might think would the detail be? You wouldn't guess it. The turning point of the case where they like finally found these three. Do you, or how they, they led to uh, what what clue they figured out that led them to them. They left a giant sign saying <laughs> Etienne was here. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I've got nothing. They forgot to take off their maple bro jackets and someone just left it at the... At the reserve? No, I'm kidding. Rookie um, mistake. <laughs> rookie mistake. No. Um, the crucial turning point of the case was the forklift. Okay. So these Federation barrels are moved by a very specific forklift that clamps onto the barrel in a very specific way that I don't okay. really understand. But what matters is it does not leave any scratches on the barrels. 
Yeah, because they, like you said, were pristine. They're pristine, exactly. Okay, all right. So they start to look at these ones that are covered. So there's a regular, you know, wear and tear of them having been taken out and like had water put in them and they're rusting and whatever and all that crap. Uh But they notice that the sides of the barrels have like very specific marks in like two specific places. And they're like, hmm, they did not move these with the forklift that we have here, which again, I don't know what the deal is, like where that forklift lives, but I guess maybe they figured it was a bad idea to try and use the real forklift that was like approved. Doc, we might leave fingerprints. Just we might, yeah. Your- I don't, I don't know what the deal is, but <laughs> they had the some fork- sort of logic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the fork, shit, the forklift that they used put spots in a very specific place on the barrels. So okay. from there, they were like, okay, what model of forklift would fit onto? this specific barrel and have the spots or have the, have it like rub and wear down in this specific area of the barrel. Okay. And it's like the whatever P27 32,000 <laughs> something or other, you know, A2010 model, whatever yeah. the shit it might be. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they kind of do this forensic-y thing and they figure it out. They're like, okay, it's this specific forklift. Okay. And then from there, they're like, okay, well, who has rented forklifts over the past year of this specific model in the area, you know, within like a whatever 20 mile radius or something. I'm not Uh sure exactly how much it was, but, uh, and then from there they found a name and from that name, the rest of the house of cards fell. Incredible detective work. It's actually pretty impressive that it's it's that specific. Yeah. Yeah. You hope that that's like what forensics can do and like you can get those deductions, but you never actually, think that's going to be likely yeah that's why i was like oh that's kind of cool that's like that's some real that's some pretty hardcore shit there yeah that's oh my gosh that's awesome because it's not like there's blood right there's right. no like, murder victim it's just like someone stole a bunch of maples how the shit do you figure that out the, apparently the forklift <laughs> the forklift did it it's always the forklift yeah <laughs> it was the forklift with the maple syrup in the, in the master bedroom <laughs> in the sugar shack in the sugar shack, yes. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Yeah. They went and tracked him down. So in the end, Richard Valier was sentenced in April 2017 to eight years in prison plus a $7 million fine with an extension to 14 years if the fine is not paid. Whoa. That's significant. That's not a joke. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Avic Caron, who owned the warehouse. Oh, uh-huh was sentenced to five years in prison, plus, uh, I believe it's a $900,000 fine. Uh, Okay, all right. Still bad. Still not good. (laughs) Etienne Saint-Pierre was sentenced to two years in jail minus one day, which I don't understand what that's all about, but (laughs) this must be some Canadian thing, Uh, followed by three years of probation and an $800,000 fine. The thing that's interesting about him to me is, is that he was operating outside of the jurisdiction of the Federation because he's in Ottawa. He's not part. He doesn't have that problem. Yeah. He's not like looped into that. Yeah. So I think he kind of just I think he was trying to just be like, I don't know where it came from. What do I give a shit? I'm just selling maple syrup to some guy who gave it to me. But they're like, you can't do that. And it like went out of jurisdiction and blah, blah, blah. It's wild. It's it's really like. Uh, it, it's very interesting to see it because I understand it from both sides of the argument. Yeah, yeah. I could, I could 100% understand being pissed off and just being like, I don't care what a bunch of bureaucrats are going to do to like set the price of this. And right. like, I, if I want to make a bunch of money, I should be able to make a bunch of money. And I don't want to have these people hauling over me and telling me what to do. And I hate the King of England and all that. Like, I fully get that part of it. And I should be able to sell it how I want. Right. Yeah. This is my syrup. <laughs> this is my syrup. I grew it. I did all the work. What the hell are you going to do? You're going to come take it from me? Eat shit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I get it. I feel like. Totally get it. That would not go well here. Yeah. Oh, absolutely not. You would not be able. I mean, unless it's, they would subsidize it in the case of corn is what we were talking about earlier, oh, which is interesting. That's true. Um, yeah. But uh, I also get the idea that they're like, hey, this entire industry could collapse with one bad year. So let's do our best to regulate it. Maybe there's some sort of middle ground between the two. I don't know. But yeah, because like they yeah, they're trying to keep this longevity. Yeah. And yeah, that makes total sense. Dang. Especially especially because it's such like a, as you pointed out earlier, like it's a point of national pride. You kind of can't. It's not like a thing that they could just be like, all right, cool. Now there's no more syrup. It's like, who are we as? 
Like, what's your national identity when that goes away? Well, and like you said, they supplied what was it like night like in the ninety like ninety percent or something yeah of the world's syrup so yeah if they have a bad year then the yeah. world has a bad breakfast year exactly yeah <laughs> IHOP full, uh, goes under there's too many people that are sucking on the teat of the federation of maple syrup in Ottawa and uh, sorry in Quebec we need the but that maple syrup it's very important so you know a lot of people hate the federation <laughs> people in the federation are like it's necessary I don't know jury's out. It's up to you, dear listener, in terms of where you stand on the matter. Yeah, but, are you pro federation or? I don't listen. We're just here to deliver the facts, which I don't even do that correctly. But <laughs> <laughs> we try. We do our best. We try. Uh, fun fact: there is a documentary on Netflix. Uh, the show is called um, "Dirty Money," I believe, and they do an episode on it. I did watch it for research, and it's really funny because it's like. I, I don't mean to laugh because it's it's a lot of money, obviously, yeah. and it's a big point of pride, but it's just it just sounds silly because they're just talking about something you put on your pancakes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's Yeah, again, there are worse things for your country to be known for. <laughs> there are worse crimes. Yeah, and also this guy, the the, the like, what's his name? Um he didn't even he's not trafficking drugs, right? Valier is like it's syrup. I mean he stole it technically, but sure. That's, like, that's the crime. Not- that's not great, but also that's not great. But before he was doing it too, like on the black, like people were, I think, selling him black market stuff, and he was the mm. they were selling them their overflow, and then he was the one taking it into the black market. Interesting. So but, yeah, he didn't just dive into this heist. Yeah, yeah, that's part of also why he was one of the first suspects. I think that they went to because they were like, oh, he's he's a known. Like I was saying, he's a known barrel roller. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. You know, it's some. That's what I mean. That like he probably. I think he sees himself as a bit of like a Robin Hood, where he's like, these laws are stupid. Like people should be able to make money this way if they want. I don't give a shit. Right. He's like, I'm actually doing everyone a favor. Kind of, like low key, kind of. Yeah. I think interesting. That's sort of how some of these people feel. So interesting, bizarre story. Um, I learned a lot about maple syrup and the way that it's made and the way that it's stolen and to not use a bad forklift when you're stealing maple syrup. Or, you know, dirty creek water that's going to rust your barrels. <laughs> Got to get your, like, filtered Fiji water to make sure that it doesn't rust. It needs to be like that Voss. <laughs> yeah. Voss, beautiful water. Like, make yeah. sure that it's pure. Yeah. You know, buy or a filter. Sand, what sand about works. Sand? Yeah, sand could work. Actually, it could work just as well. Although the, I wonder if a barrel full of sand probably weighs a lot more than 600 pounds. That's true. That's the, mm. the viscosity weight thing is what you got to yeah. figure out. If I had to come up with a solution on the yeah. spot, I also yeah. would have been like, water. Water. Easy. Right here. Just do it. It's free. We're not yeah. going to. Interesting. Dang. Yep. That's so cool. And that is the maple syrup heist. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. I really liked hearing how they like solved it in the end because I was like, it seems like they would get away with it. Right. Yeah. Uh, oh, and I think they only. Oh, shit. Again, I forgot. I read it somewhere. It's like they only recovered like. 15 percent or 20 percent of the oh. syrup so it's all gone it's all in our bellies now mm. we are the real winners <laughs> if you had any kind of pancakes or waffles or a crepe or i don't know anything else that you would put syrup on in the past 10 years you may be part of it you may have been part of eating stolen maple syrup you are entitled to claim <laughs> you're entitled to compensation <laughs> yeah no, it'd be the opposite. You might have the to pay opposite. it back. <laughs> They're gonna find you. The Federation's yeah. gonna find you. Um wow. anyway, that's the well, tab. I love that. Oh my gosh. Thank you very Great much. Great job. Thank, Thank you, you for that. So now we come to the part of the show where we will close our tabs. And Alyssa, you are in charge. What do you want to do? What sound effect would you like to put in later? I don't I feel like like the sound of like a barrel tipping over and like glick 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 syrup. Going oh, I out. like that. That's fun. That could be good. Okay. I, I also, suggestion. Yeah. Simple. Guillotine. Getting your head chopped off inside mm. the Penny Arcade. That could also work. How Do about this? That. Why don't we merge the two? Guillotine, then the glug, 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 glug of Perfect. all of the syrup coming out. Yep. I love it. Best of the both guillotine worlds. is like getting the barrel open. Yes. And, yep. Okay. Done. All right. You want to count right. us down? I would love to. All right. Ready? Yep. Okay. Three. <laughs> Two, one, close. Goodbye forever. Goodbye. Okay, moving on to listener emails. Uh, first up, our first email is from Janelle from Alameda, 
California, up north. Yes. Janelle has sent us, I'm very excited, a voice email. And I'm going to send it to you right now so you can play okay. it. My tab is about how riding on Big Thunder Mountain, specifically the one in Disney World, has been proven to help people pass kidney stones. So after Dr. David Wartinger had several patients tell him that they passed kidney stones after riding the coaster, he decided to put the theory to the test. Wartinger rode Big Thunder Mountain 20 times while carrying a 3D model of a kidney with real kidney stones inside. His findings were that if he sat in the last car of the ride, the model kidney passed the stone 64% of the time. Sitting in the first few cars, however, yielded only a 16% passage rate. Later, he did an expanded study that included, quote, riding the same roller coaster with multiple kidney models attached to the researchers. The results from the expanded study were even better. They found that sitting in the back of the ride had a nearly 70% passage rate. Ortinger had this to say about the study, quote, In all, we used 174 kidney stones of varying shapes, sizes, and weights to see if each model worked on the same ride and on two other roller coasters. Big Thunder Mountain was the only one that worked. We tried Space Mountain and Aerosmith's Rock and Roller Coaster and both failed. Well, that's it. I hope you like the tab, love the podcast, and keep it Josie. Janelle. Janelle. Oh my gosh, that was great. Thank you. Amazing. Have you ever passed a kidney stone while you're on? No, I've heard it's horrific. Yeah, especially while you're on a, on a roller coaster. You're not, you're not having a fun day at Disney if you're no. there to pass a kidney stone. Uh, okay. <laughs> wow. Make sure that's... not ride in back. That's that's what I've learned. Do not ride in or, the back of the roller coaster. Or, you know, if you need some help. That's true. Yeah, if you're trying to get it out. Yeah. If, if you've tried everything else and don't want to go to the doctor. I wonder if it's cheaper to pay a copay to go to the doctor or if it is to buy a ticket to Disneyland. Because that was, probably sounds the same amount of money. I was just thinking that. I was like, and after you pass it, then maybe you go get a churro and like have a <laughs> good true. rest of your day. You'd feel, you're right. You're right. You'd feel good. At it. It, that's probably the better move between the two. Of them. I agree. It's better value. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's cool. I love that. Yeah, that's wild. Thank you, Janelle. That's fantastic. Thank you for also. I love when we get the voice recordings. That's the best. Yeah, she did great. She did a wonderful job. Uh, Janelle also came with us to our uh, San Diego Comic Con Taco Bell trip, which was really fun. She did, and she got to try Taco Bell. Yeah, for the first time since she was a child. So that was we got to be a part of that experience. Another eventful thing that happened was on the ferry ride back, I also passed a kidney stone and it was excruciating. You did? No. Oh. <laughs> I was like you hit it so well. We were all having such a good time. I can't bring down the vibe. I have to make sure I'm still smiling. Passing I don't kidney want anyone stone. to think I'm yeah. unwell. Next time you're at San Diego Comic-Con, take the ferry. It'll help you yes. pass a kidney stone as long as you sit in the back. Sit in the back and then go to Taco Bell and wait. Get another a- kidney stone. <laughs> get, yeah, just work on the next one. Oh, that was so fun, though. I loved that. That was awesome. All right, oh you're up gosh. for the next one. All right. So listener email number two. This one is from Amber from Deltona, Florida. Hi, Alyssa and Cobbett. A few years ago, I had my first midlife crisis. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, Popped my three cats in a car and moved across the country to live in swampy central Florida. I learned about the Waffle House Index during Hurricane Ian after 97% of my town was without power, but the local Waffle House remained a beacon of hope. Weird. With the impending landfall of Hurricane Helene, I thought I'd share with you the lore surrounding the resiliency of the Waffle House in inclement weather and how FEMA views disaster-impacted areas in the South through the amount of Waffle Houses that remain open in a storm. What? Craig. (laughs) Yeah. All throughout the night, our Waffle House was still there. Apparently, so I looked at her link, and I was like, this is is cool. And you would never guess, but because they're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they're a really good indicator if, like, the damage is catastrophic enough to close. Interesting. Craig Fugate, former FEMA administrator, coined the term in 2011, and though not official, the three-tiered scale sits alongside more formal measures of storm weather. Uh, From the FEMA blog article, the index itself isn't just about whether or not you can get pralines on your waffles or if you can get waffles at all. 
but rather about the damage in a neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Or if you can get just, syrup on your waffles. Or if there's syrup available. <laughs> uh, just a neat little fact I learned that I never would have thought about before I moved here. All right. So here's why you really picked my email. The oh, worst okay. Taco Bell in the country is in my town, <laughs> a town I'm certain you've never heard of, Deltona, Florida. Okay. We watched the restaurant <laughs> with hope and excitement as it was erected earlier this year, only to read the devastating news that shortly after opening, it left Deltonans with nothing but sadness and indigestion. Why? Uh, I haven't. <laughs> she does not say why. Okay. There is an article. It says, take a gamble if you wish at the worst Taco Bell location in the U.S. It doesn't really, actually, it doesn't say kind of why. It just says the food is kind of It just says the where mess. the best and worst ones are. Yeah. Pacifica, of course, is the best. Pacifica, that sounds like something we need to go to. Yes. Not a good, okay, so it's based on the representative, representative review. Not a good first impression considering this place has just opened up. The food wasn't great at all, to be honest. The burrito looked a mess, had missing ingredients, I'm sure, and my supreme chalupa was actually missing tomato and cheese. So, you know, two out of four ingredients missing. Not bad, eh? Even paid a dollar extra for the steak, so that's laughable. So, yeah, take a gamble if you wish. I did, and it was pants, but eh, I don't know what that means. Uh, you might get food, good food. Who knows? Maybe it will improve in time. Fingers. Hey, you know what? They just opened. Leave them alone. Yeah, maybe they're still they're, training. We don't know. They're getting the hang of it. Who knows? Yeah. I still have faith. It's Taco Bell. They're not going to. They can, they can rally. I um, support the Taco Bell workers in, what was it, Fenton? Uh, Fentanyl? Del, was it Del Taco, Fentanyl, Florida. Florida. <laughs> Del Taco, Florida. De- uh, Deltona. Deltona. Was, Deltona. Del Taco, Florida. Del Taco, We support your Taco Bell. Amazing. Amber continues and says, I haven't oh, been there's brave some more enough. Left. Sorry. Yeah, there's a little bit more. I haven't been brave enough to visit this Taco Bell yet, but if you ever make it to Orlando, we'll meet you there for a chalupa. Love the pod. Love your banter. I tell most anyone I can they need to listen to 500 open tabs. <sighs> Keep it Josie. Amber. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Amber. And... Please let us know if you do go to that Taco Bell because yeah. I want to hear an update. I think you can send us pictures and we'll mm-hmm. talk about it. We also, for those of you guys who don't know, we have a Discord where there is a literal channel called Live Moss where we all hold each other's hands and being weirdly supportive of eating Taco Bell for the first time, deciding whether or not you want to go get Taco Bell for that week. It's, it's a whole thing. It's pretty wholesome. Yeah. yeah. I, I, that's probably the channel I post most in. <laughs> I'm like, all right, uh, I can lurk, but like the Live Moss people can know. Living Moss is a lot of fun. It's also like, you know, other food stuff. And I, yeah. I, I post a lot about Costco in there too, like just the food court, because I love yeah. and Joe yeah. and I both talk about like hot dogs all the time in there. But um, anyway, if you if you have a uh, listener email you'd like to submit or even better, a voice memo, a uh, voice memo that you'd like to submit, we'd love to hear them and we'd love to read them. Please send us um, an email to 500 opentabs at gmail.com. That's 500. Send us a brief explanation of your tab, the article link, of course. And lastly, where you're from, as we always say, we love to know where everybody is. Uh, It's fun to know that we have friends who are listening in other places. Yeah, if you're from Canada and you are impacted by the service. Yeah, let us know if you got any juicy deets. (laughs) Yeah. Sweet deets, I should say. Uh, But anyway, that's uh, that's the end of the email section. Now, before we go... Um, of course, as we mentioned at the top of the show, Alyssa, you're going to be at LA Comic Con. You're going to be at table A52. A- so A- close. A49. 49. A49. Yeah. Uh, why don't you show the lovely people at home who are watching on the YouTube uh, what kind of stuff you're going to have? What are some of the new things you have? What are you excited to show off? Um, okay. So this year I branched off into stickers. Uh, okay. Because I feel like it's something that people really like to put on their water bottles and they do. I've noticed that that's just like the thing at conventions anymore. Yep. Um, and so I'll show you a couple that I have. Um, I have a whole series called Sad Desserts. Already uh, love the name. And they're like little <laughs> little desserts. I'm a mess. That, yeah, they have little cute puns. Um, I like uh, this one. I, I blew, blew it. it. Okay, so the first one cake. was a chocolate chip cookie with a bite taken into it and it's sad and then now it's this sad. one's like a pink birthday cake with a candle coming up and says i blew it it's very funny yeah very so i've got a whole series of those um in sticker form now and then uh i did work on now that steamboat willie is in public domain <laughs> and i can sell it without being too worried um i have a oh. like clear vinyl sticker of him that i'm going to oh, be selling man. 
I'm getting one of those for sure. He's pretty cool. I should I should say it's it's like a skeleton version. So good for October, good for but, Halloween. But also it, the the uh, the wheel. What is the boat wheel called? I forget. Oh, the, the steering wheel. The steering wheel of the boat <laughs> is also skeleton. Is also yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really cool. It's bones. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So that's, that's cool as shit. Um, thank you. Steamboat Willie is like my favorite character. So this has been a very exciting year. Nice. Um, seeing everything that comes you're, out with that. You're finally able to reveal yourself to the world. <sighs> Just like, I don't want to, you know, make anyone mad. <laughs> so <laughs> it's my whole existence. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'll have those stickers for sale and a few others. And um, I've got like a, a new Haunted Mansion print that I'm selling. Mm. Do you have it? Um, if you don't have it right now, we can just put it up on the I screen. I don't. I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. Okay. And I yeah, think you were showing us some of the progress of that, right? You were showing, or did you oh, yeah. post did, it did or did you text the real it to one? us? I remember I seeing remember. some, I remember seeing the progress of it, but I never saw the final, but. Yeah. It was like the black and cool. white one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It looked great. So um, that'll be there and hopefully, yeah, hopefully it's fun and good weekend. It sounds like they've got a really good lineup of people coming and yeah, yeah come, come say hi. Come say I would hi. love to. I would love to chat. Um, let me know if you if you know our podcast because yeah, it's definitely please something do. I I love talking about and hearing about. So absolutely. Uh, also, I'll you have to remind me. I, I have stickers to give you to give out. Yes, 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 yes. Um, we'll have stickers for the show if you guys end up going to LA Comic Con and go to Alyssa's table and uh, tell her that you like the podcast and or even tell her that you hate the podcast. Just tell her that you know that the podcast exists. Yeah, just You'll mention get a sticker it. either way. <laughs> Don't spit, but like even if you're mad about it, we'll still give you one. Please be nice to me. <laughs> I'll be stressed. <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, Comic Con or LA Comic Con's Friday is the preview uh, nightish thing, right? Yeah, so I think they open at like. 3 p.m. is when the doors open. Okay. And uh, go till 7 that night, I think. Okay. And then full days on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, Saturday, Sunday, full days. Of course, I'll be there on Sunday again for that panel, 3 p.m. in that room that I still don't remember because I closed that window from earlier because I had to close all the tabs. Uh, but you know what? I'm going to post about it on my Instagram, at yeah. Friends. Um, go and check that one I, out. I can throw up a little Yeah, yeah, graphic. you should probably, yes, throw up the graphic. Yeah. Um, Throw it up. <laughs> Throw up all over the graphic. Just, uh, mm. Yeah, no, I'm pulling it up. Room 407 at 3 p.m. on Sunday. Of course, I'm also going to go uh, and hassle Alyssa and hang out at her booth as yes. well. So, um, Please do. I'm, I'm going to make it so that she loses an insane amount of sales by being like <laughs> talking to everybody and be like, can you get him to leave? I don't want to buy anything while he's still here. No, you will impact my sales in a good way. I'm almost sure. I hope so. Yeah. Um, but yes, we'll we'll be there on Sunday hanging out. Um, but anyway, Alyssa, congratulations on um, LA Comic Con and all your stuff. It looks wonderful. Also, congratulations on filling in for Hannah and and being the excellent co-host. I'm sure that the audience agrees. I hope. And I hope that I did her proud. And um, you absolutely yeah. did. It. She hasn't heard it, but I can tell you that we you did us both proud. We're very happy oh, to good. have you, and I, we really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, also, speaking of conventions. Um, I almost forgot. Uh, I'm going to be at New York Comic Con with Hannah uh, the weekend of Oc- the week of October 6th, 17th, I believe, is that Thursday through that Sunday. We're going to be over in Artist Alley. Come check us out. I'll have print stickers. I'll have some fun things that I should probably. Oh, I don't have them in hand right now, so we can't show them. But maybe we'll throw them up on the screen. I'll throw uh, them I up if I get them in time. Yeah, throw. Bleh. <laughs> That's how I do graphics. I just yes. Just vomit everywhere. But yes, <laughs> New York Comic Con. If you're in New York City, please come come say hi to us. Uh, all the information will be available on our Instagrams. Uh, Hannah and I will both be sharing a table. I'll also be doing originals, um, some fun originals that I'm very excited to be doing on site. So come check them out. Heck yeah, that sounds so awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I'm excited um, to do them. And because she's not here, Cat People, October 8th. Oh, right, right, right. Uh, Cat People. Hannah is promoting her book right now, but... Make sure to check it out. Yeah. Um, uh, if you guys are interested in following us on anywhere else on social media, we're at 500 open tabs on Instagram. Uh, we have a Patreon that we've mentioned before that you can go put your pennies into to make us do dumb things and chop our heads off over and over again. 
Uh, of course, <laughs> subscribe to the YouTube. We're trying to get those numbers up. We also have a Discord that you can join. There's so much happening on the Discord. The Discord's just every day, bigger and bigger. Discord's really fun. I, it's a lot of fun, it, yeah. It's it's fun to hop around on the channels there. It is. Um, of course, uh, please subscribe and rate and uh, follow the sponsor links. And lastly, if someone recommended the show to you, please go ahead and recommend it to somebody else. If you know somebody who's a Canadian or you know somebody who likes maple syrup or you know somebody who likes penny arcades or they they make miniatures or they sew stuff yeah. or they like tinkering or they like history, recommend them or this episode. Like, you know, really into guillotines. Guillotines. Who's not into guillotines these who's days? Who's not? Come on. These, yeah, you're right. Send it to your favorite guillotine uh, enthusiast. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, that's about it. Alyssa, thank you again. Do you have a, a shout out that you want to give before you end? I can't know. My, my mind's blank. You can follow me at um, Steamboat Lissy on yes. Instagram. And yeah, just thanks for having me. This has been this has been so fun. And I do actually really look forward to editing every week. So well, you get um, to edit I mean that genuinely. Your own self this week. Oh, it's, it's that's actually be weird. the worst. But yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's what I sound like. Oh. You're like, Ugh. it's going to be great. Anyway, great. Uh, <laughs> thank you again, Alyssa. And until next time, uh, Segundus Snacks. Segundus Snacks. Segundus Snacks and Shatter five times. <laughs> I'm going to let you do it. I I messed it up. I was Hannah kept saying, see at the shitting wall, which I kind of want to keep saying, but I feel like that's her phrase, so I don't want to steal it. So I can't take her phrase. No. Oh. Segundus Snacks and Shatter five times. Five times. Bye. Bye.